This month's Art Beat is supported in part by Peddler's Village in Lahaska, Pennsylvania. Good evening. I'm Susan Steele Mulholland, and I'm sitting in the living room of Doylestown artist Judith Heap. We've come to visit her today and find out about papermaking. Hi, Judith. Hi, Susan. I know that papermaking is one of your latest um, art ventures, mm -hmm. but you have been an artist for a good number of years and have quite an impressive resume. Thank you. You've, you have had many shows, and um, I think you even have something in the Philadelphia Art Museum. That's right. Um, but you've progressed through many periods of art. Mm -hmm. Did this start in Brookline? I noticed that you went to Brooklyn College. Mm -hmm. That's right. For four years, was that for art? Mm -hmm. No, well, I was an art major at Brooklyn College, and I also studied art at the Brooklyn Museum Art School, mm -hmm. uh, which is part of the Brooklyn Museum. It, it actually no longer exists. And then after that, what did you do? Um, after that, uh, later on, I uh, went to uh, Harvard to study teaching. I have a Master of Arts mm -hmm. in Teaching. And I studied some design and art history there and photography. And uh, uh, when uh, later on, I uh, wanted to concentrate more on printmaking because that mm -hmm. became a stronger, stronger interest. I was especially interested in etching. And uh, so I uh, have a Master of Fine Arts uh, from Tyler School of Art also, and I studied primarily with Romas Vieselis. And when you were at Tyler, mm -hmm. that's when you were doing etching. That's right. But I know that you've mentioned to me that Frank Stella was somebody that you admired very much, and some of your early pieces have some of that Frank mm -hmm. Stella quality. And for instance, this one, I noticed uh, when you showed me your The home. trapezoid yes. shape mm -hmm. um, and the stripes. Now, this is printmaking? That's a silkscreen print. Before I started to go to Tyler, uh, for a number of years, my work was very abstract and primarily geometric. And uh, I was uh, really concentrating on that for quite a long time, uh, geometric abstractions. But color has mm -hmm. been an important part of your work. very strong color. Mm -hmm. And the, um, the graphics even seem to have a feeling of, of texture about them, but they're very flat, mm -hmm. and they don't have any. Um, now, this one is quite interesting. Was this done after the period of um, the one we just saw? Yes. Uh, after a while, I wanted to add another element, uh, some, an element that was more express mm -hmm. expressive, and I became uh, interested in uh, making work that looked something like a musical score. So I was interested in, in the handwriting gestural kind of thing and also getting a kind of energy into the work. Did you and have so I kept I'm sorry, I kept yeah. the geometric shapes and also added this other element. Do you have name do you title your works? Yes I do. Um, do you remember what this one was? Well in fact here it is. Uh, this was uh, black and gray writing number two. Mm -hmm. And you did a whole series then of? Uh, there were several that were similar, uh, often uh, sometimes with gold, with uh, again combining geometric shapes with mm -hmm. handwriting. And often stripes or lines going through, and that was what gave it the feeling of being like a page or a musical score. Now this is, this is printmaking. Mm -hmm. This is a very mm -hmm. large piece, actually. Yes, and I also did drawings uh, that were similar using colored pencil. Uh, which I no longer have because I've, I've sold those. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now as we progress, I mean, how long would you be in a certain period? A number of years? A number of years, several years, uh, that I was working with silk screen, geometric silk screen, and then uh, progressing uh, where I was becoming, it was becoming more expressive and less geometric. And after a while, I, I almost uh, drop the geometric shapes. Now, how many years ago was something like this done, all this uh, the metallic about, feeling? And uh, probably about 10 years ago. This is, this is 10 or 12 years. You can see some of it. This looks as if it came from the previous one, a little mm -hmm, bit of, mm -hmm. this, of the gold on the black. It's kind of like that in, in developing your art that a lot of the times people ask, where do you get your yes. ideas? And 
when you are continually working in the visual arts, each piece progresses from the piece before that, so that you're really always adding something and also taking that away. That you tried before mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. something new with mm -hmm. it. Now this piece is so colorful mm -hmm. as compared this to the last This becomes even piece. more uh, gestural and full of handwriting and a lot of marks and less geometric, although the, the flat shapes are still there behind. Some people say this looks like a flag. Yes. Had the quality of it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now the feel of this paper is different from what I just That's felt. true. Um, this is uh, a, a textured rag paper and the other is a smoother paper. Then this shows it, that you were getting more interested into mm -hmm, texture. Mm -hmm. That's right. Now, is this does this predate the work that you are most recently doing? This one. Yes. As time went on, I became interested in uh, more complexity, uh, adding collage elements, mm -hmm. uh, and also um, I became more interested in doing one of a kind pieces as opposed to series of prints, editions of prints. These are. This is a silk screen print, uh, and I would make editions, let's say, of uh, between 15 and 30. And I found a greater spontaneity and expressiveness in uh, one-of-a-kind pieces. Uh, and I was also more successful with them um, as far as uh, exhibiting and marketing mm -hmm. my work. And so I gradually uh, stopped doing prints. There is another reason that I uh, stopped doing prints, and, and that had to do with the toxicity. Yes. Um, the, the amount of solvents uh, in the oil-based inks uh, and in the lacquer-based stencils. So uh, I felt more comfortable uh, with one-of-a-kind pieces, more spontaneous, and, and I think I, I liked the results that I was getting. I noticed that you have um, something here that talks about the muse, and I know mm -hmm. that that's been something that's very important to your mm -hmm. life. Would you tell us about that? Well, when I finished at Tyler, I felt as though I needed some kind of connection uh, in the city and also with other artists. And I started to make inquiries uh, to various people mm -hmm. as to whether there might not be a need for a women's cooperative gallery in Philadelphia. Uh, I had a very good friend who had started a, a similar kind of gallery in Rhode Island, in Wakefield, Rhode Island, called Hera, which still exists. And I wrote to a woman whose uh, name is Judith Brodsky, who was very much involved with Women's Caucus for the Arts. And we started to meet at Beaver College, and she knew a lot of people because of Women's Caucus for Art, and she drew in art historians, uh, art critics, uh, and other artists who were interested. And eventually there was a group of nine artists and uh, we found a space and began having exhibits. This is sort of an interesting story, but our first opening uh, where we had sent out something like 2,000 invitations uh, was the night of one of the worst snowstorms that ever uh, existed in the history of Philadelphia. And uh, we had to, of course, uh, cancel and then uh, we, we did postpone and, and have the opening the following week, and it, it was well attended, but it w that was a, a great disappointment. Now, are you still involved with this? Um, I, after, I was involved with the gallery for a number of years. Uh, the gallery is still very strong uh, and, and has, uh, in fact, right now a show of Brazilian women mm -hmm. artists, which opened last night. Um, a separate part of the gallery developed, which was a foundation uh, for publicly oriented uh, types of things, uh, workshops, seminars, and lectures, and films, and so forth. And I directed that for a while, and then eventually stepped down and, and was a board member. And at a certain point when I was teaching and needed more time for my own work, I just Had severed to. that mm -hmm. connection. But it must feel good to have been a, at the spearhead of something oh, for Oh, absolutely. I, I think it was really a worthwhile experience. Uh, in April, uh, Muse held its, and that's what this catalog is, Yes. Uh, tenth uh, anniversary at the Painted Bride, so it was, and it was also uh, the inaugural exhibition of the Painted Bride uh, Art Gallery's new gallery space. And in fact, uh, Oliver Franklin, uh, Commissioner for Culture for Philadelphia, came oh. and read a proclamation, and uh, oh, that we made exciting. speeches, and many, many people came. It was really a very nice exhibit. When I know that you teach also, mm -hmm. and that you now teach at Penridge. That's right. But then, how do you find time to do? work? 
Uh, that's difficult. Uh, I worked a lot during the summer. Uh, I worked on a commission and I started several pieces. And uh, now I'm, it's difficult to find time mm -hmm. during the school year. But you look <laughs> forward to those vacations. Yes, absolutely. I would really like to see how you make paper. Is it in, could you show us the process? Oh, sure, sure. The first step in making paper would be uh, what I start with are called linters, which are, they look like cardboard. They're uh, pressed paper, and I tear those up and soak them in a bucket. And after I do that, I put the linters, the pieces of paper from the linters, into a, a, bu into a bucket and beat them up with a large beater. Uh, after I've made a large quantity of pulp, then I uh, dehydrate it so that I can use as much as I want. And that's what this is. This is a bucket of, of the dehydrated pulp uh, that I've just squeezed the water out of and I can store and use when I'm ready to do some work which I'm going to do right now. I'm going to make a sheet of paper. Uh, the reason I keep it this way is this way it won't spoil. There's a big problem with paper. If it's in a liquid form, it would spoil. It would actually rot. So uh, today I'm taking a little bit of this at one time and just rehydrating it in a small blender. This can be a problem as it was for me last night when I burned out a blender and smoke started rising from it because I had too much pulp in the blender. So I'm using a different one and adding the pulp to this vat where I almost have enough and I'll just take a little bit more, add some water to it And this time I'm going to add a couple of things that I need in the paper. One of them is just a little bit of calcium carbonate. And I'm going to add a little bit just so that that will keep the paper from being too acid, too acidic. It maintains a pH neutral balance. And I'm also going to add a little bit of sizing to the whole vat. And that will make it possible for me to draw on the paper or paint on the paper without having it bleed. And that's not, that's not working. There we go. I had a little problem with blenders today. See how that mixture is. Okay, and I'm going to add this to the vat. It probably needs just a little bit more beating, but mixing that up. And then I'm going to form a sheet, and I have over here, and this I made myself. This is a typical Western uh, mold and deckel. This is the deckel. That's what will form what's called the deckel edge. And I'm going to uh, form a sheet of paper, and uh, I can do that just by placing the mold and deckel in the vat and pulling up a sheet. Now, one other thing, if I wanted color, this is just a, a, a white, this is the color of the pulp. This, by the way, is cotton uh, mixed with a little bit of abaca. But I did want to add some color, and I use uh, some pigments, which are called aqueous dispersed pigments. These are just color concentrates, and they come in a liquid form. So I'm going to add some of that right now. And I need to mix that with water first. This is not a, a toxic pigment 
uh, the way uh, powdered dyes would be. Since this is uh, a liquid, it's a uh, fairly safe kind of uh, color to use. Mix it with water so that it won't be too concentrated. And then I'm just going to add that to the mixture of pulp. Need a lot of water with the pulp. And I also often use uh, some kind of sparkly stuff in my work, so I'm going to add a little bit of that. Normally, I would uh, mix this up in a in a stronger blender since my blender's not not working that well. I'm just going to do it by hand. Oh. And the dyes really have to sit a while. And next I'm going to add something that's called retention agent. The retention agent will make the fibers absorb the dye. Otherwise it might just stay in the water. I'm also diluting that with water because it's always better to, to dilute a chemical before you add it. Now I'm going to test this to see how well it's taken the color and I can tell how dark the color is going to be by squeezing it out because when I squeeze it that's pretty much the way it's going to look when it's when it's dry. So if I want it to be really intense, I would have to add more color, but I'm not going to do that right now. This seems okay. Now that's not, that's a fairly light color, and a lot of the times in paper making, the color is fairly light unless you really increase the intensity, keep adding more and more dye. And usually if I was making a piece, I might experiment with mixing colors for a little while before I settle on a color. And I'm going to now take my mold and deckle, and I need to make sure that the pulp is stirred up, that doesn't settle to the bottom. And when that's all stirred up, these trays, by the way, are kind of trays that just an ordinary uh, plastic tray people use for utility purposes. And I'm going to stir this back and forth so that it's even. If I don't like the sheet that's formed, I would just do what's called kissing it off, which would be to just flip it back over onto the surface if I don't like the sheet and send that back in again and start again stirring up the pulp. That's a pretty nice color. I'm pretty pleased with this color. But as I said, it'll dry much lighter and I'm going to get the extra pulp off of here. Put the mold and deckle back together again. Make sure it's stirred. This is hard on your back, unless you have a higher setup. I'm rocking this back and forth and side to side so that the sheet will be even. I'm removing the mold. Sorry, I'm removing the deckle. And the glitter clumped a little bit in a couple of places. I think I might just leave that. And I need to drain all of the water off.
That might take a few minutes. A lot of people say that paper making is pretty labor intensive because there are so much time involved, so many steps until you get to the final product. Next thing I'm going to do is uh, normally you cooch a sh flat sheet of paper, which just means releasing it onto wet blankets in order to, uh, to have a flat surface and absorb some of the water and dry the paper. Uh, I'm going to do that, and then I'm going to transfer my sheet to a, uh, a piece of linoleum that I've carved and uh, actually cast the paper. So I'm pretty much finished right now with this phase. It's important to spray the blankets that the uh, paper is going to go on. I have felt and then pellon, uh, which is used in sewing. We're now in another room, which is the major part of my studio. And I'm going to take the piece of paper, which is uh, on the mold, and cooch it onto these felts. And we try and release it. And then I'm going to have to dry it a little bit. Uh, and I'm going to sponge off the back just a little to help release it. The reason I got interested in paper making is the possibility of casting, getting some dimension into my work. And what I'm working with right now is linoleum, this linoleum plate, which I'm carving and painting and then pressing the paper onto this painted carved surface and picking up all of the impressions as well as the color. Well, this would normally come right off. We waited such a long time that um, I, I'm going to, I would have to make another sheet unless I can get this off here. OK. This might be actually perfect for casting. We waited a long time. and. Uh, left the paper on the mold for a long time, and it didn't come right off. Um, but in the process of doing that, it has dried quite a bit, which is just about exactly the way I'd like to get it to put it on the mold. So I'm going to press a little bit more water out of it, and it's dry enough now to handle and be able to place on the form that I want to cast from. We've gotten most of the water out of that. And I can lift this now, the sheet. And put this right in the center of this form. Lay that down and bring the other piece over. And now just sponge it onto that form, pushing it into all of the areas to get an impression. Pick that up. I might uh, take a further step with this, which is to put it through my press. I have an etching press over here, which shouldn't be used for that. It, it's not good to get water into it. But I have been using it for that. And you can see this is starting to uh, pick up the impression. And this will be left to dry right on here. It will pick up both the color on the piece of linoleum and the 
pattern and texture. When I see that all of the texture is coming through, then I'll stop and let this dry for a couple of days. And I would probably, uh, in especially when it's warm, I would have a fan set up next to it and uh, keep it just so that it dries a little more quickly so that it doesn't rot while it's on here. And once it's dry, it's more stable, and then I can draw or paint on it. Okay. Now this is the back. This is not the piece. The front of it will be the other, the other side, which when it comes off, will have the impression of the linoleum and whatever color is on it. And then I might also paint or draw on it or stitch or add other materials. I've also at this stage sometimes torn pieces of the uh, paper and then added other paper. Judith, is this piece basically finished now? Well, it could be finished and just as it is, uh, but more often than not, after it dries and I pull it off, I use various materials that I add to it. Uh, sometimes I stencil onto the piece. Uh, sometimes I stitch or use uh, oh, materials, lace and, and metallics and so forth. Sometimes I draw. Um, Would you I do have that at this point? Well, no, now it's wet, mm -hmm. so I would have to, to wait for it to dry and then turn it over because it's the other side that I'm considering as the front side because that's what would be picking up the color yes. from here and the impression. The so, impression's already there, but it will become more right. distinct. Now, is this your very latest work? For the most part, uh, this, this is. I've been working with the fan shape as an image for a long time. Uh, and having part of the work raised in the form of handmade paper shapes and then working with drawing uh, and stenciling and often stitching into the paper as well. Yes. Where do you think you're going to go next? I mean, where's Judith Heap going to be in a year from now? Well, that's a, <laughs> that's a difficult question to answer. Uh, but I'd like to continue working with handmade paper. I've, the most you know, recent things, more and more I've been working with just handmade paper uh, and getting more and more sculptural, getting away from uh, flat pieces. And this is satisfying for mm -hmm. you as a Yeah, as I really enjoy it. Judith, thank you for having us in your studio today. Oh, it's my pleasure. We'll be watching to see what happens next in your career. Thank you. This is Susan Steele Mahalan saying good night for Artbeat. This month's Artbeat was supported in part by Peddler's Village in Lahaska, Pennsylvania.